hello everyone. Welcome to this short presentation on the application of deep learning in post-processing ensemble weather forecasts. Um, as we will be doing this presentation without the uh, with the web client of Zoom, you'll just have to speak up so I can hear the questions, as I won't really uh, be able to see the raised hands. All right. The results I will present today are part uh, of ongoing research done at SPCL performed by a larger team and will focus on the latest paper accepted for publication in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society A. Um, Surely about me, I'm just a master's student uh, and have been doing my bachelor thesis and now my master's thesis on this topic at the Scalable Computing Lab with the support from the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. Firstly, weather forecasting is a chaotic process. The effects of this are no mystery to all of us. Uh, when we expect good weather and are getting ready for a hike, it rains, or just a joy as an unexpected snowfall on the 1st of December. Um, but on a more global uh, aspect, this can have devastating effects on housing, as well as food and lives even, if we are unable to take adequate measures to prepare ourselves. But what does this chaoticity mean and how does it come to be? Well, from what we know today, weather forecasts are influenced by the smallest of perturbations in their initial state and therefore react in a chaotic, often unpredictable manner in the worst case. And currently, these perturbations come from many different steps in forecasting. That means measurements themselves, floating point imprecisions, model bias, etc. Therefore, these uncertainties are also displayed with every forecast, as you can see here. On the left is an example for a hurricane trajectory, uh, and on the right you can see the estimated amount of uh, precipitation. And every time there is certain uncertainties marked with it. So now, why should we look into optimizing numerical weather predictions and their post-processing? Currently, the uncertainty measures you see are done through ensemble, meter ensemble mem model forecasting. Those ensemble models consist of several trajectories run in parallel, which are perturbed in their initial state and sometimes during the forecasting process. You can see an example of this on this graphic on the left here. Finally, through the output distribution, we can then gain an estimate of the reliability of the prediction. These methods are good, but there's still a need for more precise methods, as they can still fail, which can result in billions worth of damages. To, more, to go more in depth, there are two large factors that restrict weather forecasting. Firstly, forecast needs to be made available in time for them to be useful to the end user. Or more precisely, even though they rank amongst the highest consumers of high performance computing, they are bound by a computational bottleneck that is given by the available resources and time due to its high complexity. Secondly, the models cannot factor every single particle that is within Earth's domain to do a simulative comp computation. These computations are already very expensive as the ECMF, for example, uses up to 51 trajectories in its operational ensemble to account for the forecasting uncertainty. So this is where relatively cheap post-processing methods come in handy. By performing simple regressions on their outputs, they can compensate for certain model biases and uncertainties. Examples of these are the ensemble model output statistics and the Bayesian model averaging, which will not go into too much detail. But this is also where the recent search in the development of neural networks uh, has a large role in play. There have been several initial trials to apply neural networks to the numerical weather uh, forecasting pipeline, for example, for solar radiation calculation. But only with the recent surge in neural networks has there been a renewed interest to apply these networks to weather forecasting, and for good reason. High throughput computational structures such as the GPU allow for extremely efficient prediction capabilities, which weren't available before. A recent example is the simple feed for it, uh, networks from Lurch et al, which has as aim to post-process the output of single weather stations in Germany. Where our work is different. Lurch et al focuses on these station-specific measurements. However, there hasn't been any specific work done on post-processing global forecasts with neural networks. It is clear that there is a lot of information in the spatial distribution of weather 
that Lurchidal tries to first incorporate using fixed embeddings and a fully connected network. But there is also another method from computer vision that achieves this at many different scales and for quite cheap in terms of computational costs. And those are convolutional neural networks. Based on those, the aim of our work is to reduce the computational costs of running ensemble forecasts, augment the current methods, and do this on a global scale. You can find our research so far online if you Google these titles. Aside from the bachelor thesis, everything is available in our archive. The most recent one is the one that this presentation is based on. So how do we go about post-processing numerical weather prediction? Firstly, <coughs> we assume that the trajectories follow a Gaussian distribution. We will take this as a given from the weather forecasting domain. Now, assuming Gaussian distribution of the ensemble members, there are several ways of predicting the distribution. Either we predict several members and then take their mean and spread, or we predict a mean and spread separately. So in previous work, we trusted uh, the prediction capabilities of a, of a network predicting 10 ensemble members. However, the predictions proved worse than predicting a single output. In fact, it was over 20% worse in spread prediction, as you can see, and 40% worse in the mean prediction. Therefore, we decided to split the prediction uh, of mean and spread into two separate tasks, spread prediction and mean prediction, or as we'll call it now, bias correction. We found that then applying two different types of networks proved to be the most successful. Therefore, our tasks will be to, firstly, predict the spread, secondly, predict the mean or perform bias correction, and thirdly, perform a probability density function calibration on the results of those two tasks. Now then, before we continue, let's review some of the different layers of neural networks quickly and their respective advantages. So for fully connected networks, at this point, you've probably seen and heard a lot about fully uh, connected networks, um, but let's just go it quickly. The input features are multiplied by a learnable parameter, then shifted with a bias, and finally, a nonlinear function is applied to the output. The advantages are it's a very generic architecture, taking into account every feature that is passed as input. On the flip side, it is very inefficient and needs to train and store parameters for each connection from input to output features. Contrary to this, convolutional neural networks, pseudo so inductive bias on data structure allow for a much more efficient training and parameter storage than for the connected networks. It is also this inductive bias on the data structure that we aim to use to our benefit in our work. We also use another layer type that I'll introduce shortly, the locally connected layer. This layer uses the inductive bias of the convolutional networks, but removes the translational equivariance of the CNN operator. In other words, it takes into account several features around the specific region, but not all of the inputs. These are the colored kernels you can see here. Uh, the locally connected, yeah, the, so it does this by just taking uh, the region around a, a certain point on the feature map and uh, puts it on one single output. Now, these techniques have been available for some time, but when we began with this research in 2018, nobody that we knew of had tried applying these network structures to numerical weather forecasting pipelines. This is probably a lot to do with the fact that a lot of the processable data is not easily or openly available to deep learning researchers worldwide, as they are also very large data sets. But through the help of Peter Dubin from the ECMRF, we managed to obtain some data which we have now also made publicly accessible. So now let's delve into the specifics. We aim to make our model applicable to production pipelines in weather forecasting. But with the ECMRF using 51 trajectories, the data not being available to us and production quality always changing, we need to simulate this data as closely as possible. Therefore, we have made use of other data sets provided by the ECMRF. It encompasses the ERA5 as well as ENS10 data, newly public data sets. So, ENS10 consists of the model output data of the ECMRF hindcast experiments. These are ensemble forecasts with 10 ensemble members that are spread over 20 years from 1998 to 2017 with two forecasts per week and diverse parameters. 
It's a newly public data set and it's freely accessible online, even in already pre-selected form if you go on our GitHub so that you can run our experiments from end to end or try your own neural networks from it. In contrast, year five is the fifth weather reanalysis performed by the ECMUF. It consists of an hourly high resolution or HRES, as we call it, data available uh, that is in 0 0.25 degrees resolution and a 10 member ensemble for uncertainty estimates in a 0 0.5 degree resolution. The forecasts do, however, only go up to 12 hours lead time. We use ENS10 as input for all of predictions and ERA5 as ground truth values for bias correction network. Both of the data sets provide diverse parameters. Uh, you can see an example of those in the left table here, which we need to perform a selection. So for ENS10 that we selected as our input, uh, we select temperature, geopotential, UV winds, divergence, vertical velocity, and specific humidity at uh, two pressure levels, three different lead times between zero and 48 hours at the max resolution that is available. And we select one to five trajectories out of the 10 possible. From ERA5, we just use it as ground truth data in the bias correction. Therefore, we just use temperature and geopotential at the same height uh, levels, pressure levels, sorry, at the zero hour lead time. So just whatever was measured. Uh, the same resolution and we just take the mean. So what do we do with this data? Let's go back to our two initial tasks. Firstly, you have the spread prediction, uh, which takes as input a reduced number of ensemble members at three different lead times, uh, consisting of the spreads or standard deviation of one to five trajectories in the control trajectory and predicts the full ensemble at 48 hours lead time for T850, so temperature at 850 hectopascal, and geopotential at 500 hectopascal, or Z500, as we'll call it. Model for these, bo uh, both of these parameters are trained separately. Secondly, we have the bias correction, which is on the left. Uh, Again, it takes as input the reduced number of ensemble members at different lead times and tries to predict the actual measured temperature at 48 hours lead time, which is given by ERA5 data. But to make this data available to neural networks, it first needs to be processed. To facilitate the training of the networks, we therefore pre-process pre and save the data before starting the training pipeline. So initially, we get the data in these unordered grid messages, which is similar to protocol buffers. And from there, we extract information through EC codes, which is a library from ECMVF, and splits it into sets of NumPy arrays. These are then further split into validation, training, and test sets. Uh, we've selected fixed years, with the test sets being the latest years. This is because we want to predict future uh, weather. But we've also tried other splits and the results were comparable or uh, even better. So from there, we apply channel-wise standardization and cast the data from float 64 to float 32. And finally, we end up with a TensorFlow record data set, which can be efficiently read in by the TensorFlow network uh, framework. But on the topic of standardization, it is also important to note that we usually perform this to reduce the workloads that the network has to do and help with prediction. However, in this case, just performing a regular standardization with one mean and standard, devi standard deviation globally will lead to highly differing values. Therefore, we have tried to come up with a heuristic that preserves local features but differs depending on the region. We call this heuristic local area standardization. Um, using the measurements of the training sets, which is the data from 1999 to 2013, we apply two moving aggregation filters. So one is for the mean and one is for the standard deviation, which will then both lead to a reduced map of means and standard deviations respectively. Then we perform a wraparound padding for the longitudes and a mirrored padding for the latitudes before applying a blur with a Gaussian filter. Uh, the blur with the Gaussian filter is just to take into account neighboring regions as well, and it helps the upscaling process in that sense. As a side note, the moving mean and standard deviation filter size is the size of our largest convolutional filter, 
The idea there is that whatever area the initial convolutions will be performed on will more or less have been standardized by the same mean and standard deviation. If you look at the outputs we get for these standardization maps uh, for T850 and using the training set from the ENS10, uh, for example, you can see there are large differences in weather that definitely cannot just be neglected when looking at the global weather predictions. Through testing, we found that this step is important for purely convolutional networks, as it aims to implement a sense of locality. However, that also means that it can also be left out in networks that perform a pointwise regression, as this will also account for the local prediction bias to some degree. By using this standardization, we have seen a faster conversions and better results for uncertainty quantification network. Now we've looked at pre-processing. Let us also look at the networks that we use to process it. And for that, it is important to introduce a network structure that we have been basing all of our networks on. The unit. Uh, the name stems from its design. As you can see, it's shaped like the U. The unit performs convolutions and pooling operations to extract features at each level before upscaling the processed features again. Very important is that it is using residual connections as the gray arrows you can see to concatenate, to concatenate features from a downscale level to the upscale features. This is originally to help the network reestablish larger features that might have gotten lost in the upscaling process. It has been largely used in medical imaging to segment cells and other tissue and has proven itself extremely efficient. It was the network used in our original research and our current networks have evolved from it to better fit the respective tasks. So we'll look at both of them now. Firstly, we have our network for the spread prediction. So without going into too much detail, we basically adapted the layers to have a wider receptive field per neuron without downscaling and introduced additional residual layers. These inception style layers allow our network to choose between a receptive field of arbitrary size. After several of these layers, we obtain a prediction, and from there we then take a weighted mean with the output of these inception style layers, as well as the, the numerical weather uh, forecast reduced also model outputs to make our final prediction. The idea is to combine uh, different predictive methods and architectures and output a learned mixed estimate of the full ensemble spread. So for more data, I just refer to the RSA paper. For the bias correction network, as you can see, it's closely based on the original UNET's architecture. However, we have removed, uh, removed a few levels as we didn't see any added benefit when performing our ablation studies, as you'll see later. And more importantly, we have added one locally connected layer, which basically performs a linear regression on each endpoint of our prediction. When using our local area standardization with this network, we saw no major changes and we speculate that this is because we account for the local bias through our locally connected layer already. Again, for further details, just please refer to the paper. Now, before specifying our training procedure and our evaluation, we need to go over some of the metrics we use to train and determine the forecast skill. Firstly, there is the mean square error and the root mean square error, which you probably already know. However, those do not suffice to fully capture the goodness of fit between a prediction and the ground truth. Therefore, we also make use of the structural similarity, or SSIM, which has been widely used in computer vision. You can basically visualize the mean squared error as a plane of infinite fits on the same mean squared error. On this plane, the highest SSIM is the fit that has the most structural similarity. This is defined by having a filter pass over both images and comparing their local similarities. You can see an example of this on the three images at the bottom. Uh, on the left is the ground truth. And then there is the middle and the right images, which both have the same mean squared error, but the one on the right has the most structural similarity. Sorry. Finally, we also use the CRPS, so the continuous rank probability score, which is a metric that measures the difference between a prediction and a ground truth distribution by taking the integral of the square of the difference. And you can visualize this difference here as the green area, so the integral of the square of that. The continuous rank probability skill score is then just a measure of relative improvement of the CRPS compared to the original forecast from the ensemble. Those two metrics are just standard in the weather forecasting domain to eval evaluate the reliability of ensemble forecasts. So what are our networks trained on? 
As both are regression tasks, we initially trained our networks to aim to reduce the mean squared error and therefore train them with MSC. However, we found that when training on SIM, the model arrived at better results when also augmenting the number of parameters used in the model, where performing the regression on mean squared error usually plateaued. However, when using it on the bias correction network, the size of the network became a bit too large and therefore it was kept to train on the mean squared error loss. Then, after training the network separately, we also performed a run in which we used the bias corrected forecast as input to our spread prediction network and train on the CRPS in the final probability density function calibration step. So this is the third step that we took. As general baselines, we took a pointwise linear regression and performed EMOS on the reduced ensemble. Training time is around four hours on an NVIDIA V100 each per network. For the evaluation, we set up a notation for our models according to what produced the spread and what produced the mean, which you can see on the right. And we'll keep that on the top right for the next slides. First, we can look at the evaluation of the networks towards their targets separately. The spread prediction brings a constant improvement of around 16% for its predictions on both variables, meaning it can effectively augment the five member ensemble predictions and generally has a squashing effect on the root mean squared error towards the full ensemble. In other words, there are less outliers. The bias correction network also managed to improve the predictions by around 7% for temperature and 2% for geopotential. Note that this time it is using the reduced ensemble to predict the ERA5 ground truth. Therefore, the results are compared to the full ensemble already. We surmise that the difference between the T850 and Z500 prediction capabilities are due to the fact that T850 is likely to show more significant biases. Next, we can also look at some ablation studies we performed on both networks. For the spread, we show a short ablation study about the number of trajectories used in the prediction of TH150. As a baseline, aside from the raw ensembles themselves, use the linear regression. Here we can see that we get twice the improvement from the uncertainty quantification network compared to a simple linear regression, which is equivalent to adding another trajectory to the ensemble. And while the relative improvement does decrease with the number of trajectory used, this can also be related to the fact that we're using a larger proportion of trajectories out of the full ensemble at every increase. So if we used 100% of trajectories, we could maximally get a relative improvement of 0%, obviously. For bias correction, we can see that both T850 and Z500 benefit from at least a slightly larger receptive field. However, for geopotential, accounting for a local bias through a locally connected network in other words, a pointwise regression, seems to be very important. Finally, we also look at the importance of auxiliary parameters. First, we already obtained a good improvement using only the forecast parameters. However, we can also see that adding the other parameters brings a large boost in predictive performance for temperature, both for the uncertainty quantification as well as for the bias correction. Finally, we evaluate the combination of our networks in our PDF calibration step. Again, evaluated on our test set of 2016-2017, uh, we, we evaluate the combination of our networks with respect to the CRPS. Green are the networks trained on CRPS, blue are the ones trained on SCM and mean squared error, red are ground truth values. We can see a fairly strong improvement for temperature, especially in the combined networks, where they already outperform the full ensemble in terms of average forecast skill measured by CRPS. Similarly for geopotential, where we see smaller improvements. Just recently, for comparison, we also ran an EMOS model on the test set using five trajectories for T850 to compare our values, and we saw a relative improvement of 5.5% which is quite a bit worse than the 14.5% using our V5, U5C. So the combined model using five trajectories. Now, this was on the average case. However, it is hard to gain an understanding of how these predictions can be helpful and useful without visualizing them. Therefore, we selected a few extreme weather case studies to evaluate the predictive capabilities. I will show you one of those cases for TH150, however, Keep in mind that these examples cannot conclusively prove that one method is better than the other. 
So during January 2016, an unprecedented cold wave rushed over East and South Asia, leading to record lows. We focus on a forecast for January 24th, where the T850 forecast CRPS has its worst spike. In other words, where the forecast was at its worst. Firstly, it's important to point out that due to the insufficient sampling of the probability distribution, even the E5 prediction can sometimes be better than that of the E10 prediction, as we see here. However, if we look at our predictions, the overall CRPSS of the selected window amounts to a relative improvement of around 19% on the largest affected, on the largest affected area. Um, if we look at the center of this area, it's even an improvement of over 25%. In this example, the deep learning model brings a very large improvement with slightly worse forecast abilities for non-extreme parts of the weather forecast, so the region around this center. To show a comparison of the prediction for the whole globe on that same day, this is the whole map. Here you can see that the predictions are fairly similar. However, the combined deep neural network seems to have very strong predictive capabilities when it comes to forecast busts or general regions where the awesome forecast struggles low. For example, South America, the Pacific Ocean, and other regions that you can see here. We surmise that this is due to the square terms in the MSC or SM loss functions, as well as the CRPS loss, making our models more sensible to those outliers. For more examples, see the paper. In summary, we can say that DNN show large amounts of promise in our case, in this case, using only half the available trajectories. This means that our models are able to provide a large improvement for only a very low additional cost made possible through their structures and GPUs. Finally, our models show large forecast scale improvements for forecasts where the original awesome forecast performs extremely bad. Now, I'm done with this presentation, but if this interests you and you want to read more about it, please refer to our paper and GitHub, and I'm open to answering any questions should there be any. Thank you.